You'll stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. This morning, our passage comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Let's give our attention to the reading of Scripture. This is God's Word. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw... Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So far the reading of God's holy word, we give thanks for it as we come to consider this portion of scripture. Let us pray for God's help. You may be seated. I believe the children will dismiss, the young children will dismiss as we pray. Father God, we know that you are the infinitely holy one over all creation. You are the one who is so pure that we as sinners should not be able to approach you. And yet, here we come to consider a book where you, in grace and in love, have spoken to your people. You have left us this deposit of inspired revelation that we might know you and be brought near to you. And we pray that as we continue to consider Christ and the nature of his kingdom from this gospel, which you have left to us, that you would give us insight into how we might more deeply appreciate what you would teach us here. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your word that it might bring forth fruit in our hearts to love you more, to serve you better. And we ask all of this in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen.
All right, so sometimes when you're browsing in the grocery store aisle, your attention may be caught by some sort of fascinating label, right? That can be the thing that convinces you to buy it. At times, the branding, the logos, the boxes, design, whatever it may be, can be the thing that sparks your interest to convince you that you need this food, right? All well and good. Sometimes, though, if you turn over that box and read the nutrition facts, you might be surprised to find something on the ingredients list that you really didn't expect to be there. Something like anchovy paste as a leading ingredient in your cheesecake. (laughs) The point is that sometimes our first impression of what something should be, as advertised by the sound of the rhetoric, doesn't account for some of its surprising features. Mark 1, 1 to 20 continues to prove the surprising nature of God's kingdom arriving in Christ. There may have been assumptions based on the label God's kingdom, and yet here we learn what's actually inside. Last time we saw that uh, this kingdom focuses in Christ as a gospel kingdom. When Israelites expected a political Messiah to lead a national revolution restoring religion and godliness by the right governmental means, well, and they were waiting on an outward kingdom with a flashy king who gave them the sort of kingdom they expected and well wanted. Instead, Mark shows the Messiah, God's Son, who is the Christ, was introduced to the world not by a splendid court, but by a guy in the desert eating bugs and wearing strange clothes. Instead of arriving with pomp and circumstance, he spent time in the wilderness. Instead of bringing military might, he had a message of repentance and faith. Christ confounded nearly everything that the people living under the Mosaic Covenant had expected in their coming Messiah. And we then find ourselves sort of in the middle of this gospel's two governing questions. Who is Jesus and what is his kingdom? And Mark shows us answers from the outset but also tells the story so that we follow along in the process of learning the answers with the people who encountered Jesus in his ministry. Now again, Mark's, as we touched on last week, Mark's summary of Jesus' opening uh, ministry in verses 14 and 15 is is a transition Section belonging both to the parts that came before and after it. And there we read, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Having started to pull at the thread of Jesus' opening statement, we need to take one more pass at what these verses and its surroundings tell us about Jesus and the nature of God's kingdom. So our main point today is that Christ founds a gospel kingdom that summons us to come to Christ. Christ founds a gospel kingdom that summons us to come to Christ. And we'll think about this together in three points. Establishment expectations, and expansion. So first, let's consider together establishment. Before we we sort of press far ahead, even into the next little section that we've added today of Mark's gospel, we need to account a bit more for some things happening in the, the opening narrative and how it presents the king who will announce the kingdom. So we, we started tugging at this a little bit concerning how the narrative shows the king's lowly beginnings and how his gospel kingship 
is inherently woven into the Old Testament story. Right? That's why this gospel begins with a citation from the Old Testament. Again, so we cannot understand rightly the gospel about Jesus without the Old Testament because Christ's gospel accords with all that God had worked throughout redemptive history and inspired in Scripture. So as we noted last time about that opening citation from the Old Testament, Mark bound together uh, quotes from Exodus, Isaiah, and Malachi to highlight Jesus' coming as the prophesied second Exodus. That leading theme in the portion of Isaiah uh, to which he ascribes uh, the main point. When God brought, now to, to bring some of this more together, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, that first Exodus became the, the paradigm for how all of God's Old Testament people understood salvation. It became the lens of, of explaining what they, they understood salvation from God to mean. And according to that paradigm, that, that way of understanding, Isaiah foretold the coming next iteration of God's saving work. And this second exodus, Mark tells us, arrives in the Lord Jesus. Mark's story, though, has, has some layers to it. His biblical quotation signals the overt lesson that, about the second exodus, but, but then leads into a more implicit teaching of the same point in the story. So Mark, really, he makes a good pastoral move here. He tells you what his point is, and then he shows you what it looks like. And so he tells us that Jesus brings the second exodus. And then he shows us what that looks like. And so in that regard, we need to frame Jesus' opening actions here in this gospel within the wider scope of biblical history. If we think all the way back to Genesis' creation narrative... Well, it begins, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, we know also that God made, by special creation, Adam and Eve. And Luke 3, verse 38, says to us that Adam was the Son of God, the created Son of God. Not his natural son, but nonetheless his son. And then God placed Adam in paradise where he faced temptation concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Adam then failed and was exiled from the Garden of Eden. Jump ahead a fair bit. In the first Exodus... God brought Israel through the waters of the Red Sea. And then Exodus 4.22 explains to us that the Lord said, Israel is my firstborn son. And then God gave the law to Israel. Just after which Moses said, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. God then sent the nation into the wilderness for 40 years concerning this testing. And so God, in a sense, called Israel to Adam's task. Again, also calling them his created son, distinct from his natural son, the second person of the Trinity. Israel also failed in their task and so were exiled from the promised land. Maybe you see a pattern forming. Waters. The Son of God comes through them. Right? And then there's a testing, whether in paradise or the wilderness, and failure. 
And back in Mark's prologue, Christ goes through the waters of baptism just as the Spirit hovered over the creation waters and appeared in a pillar of smoke and fire to lead Israel from the Red Sea waters. Just like that, the Spirit descends to hover upon Christ. God announced Him as His faithful Son, contrasting with Adam and Israel, and yet Christ still goes into the wilderness for testing. In other words, Christ picked up this pattern of water, spirit, special location, testing. The difference is that Christ faithfully fulfilled rather than failed his testing. So we have a thematic description of of Christ's work forming an important foundation for God's kingdom. After all, well, we remember also, don't we, that when God created man in his image, he commanded them to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves over the earth. Dominion just is another way of describing kingship. And as Christ is the faithful Adam, Paul does call him the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15 after all. As he is the faithful Adam, he secures the proper basis for God's kingdom. Maybe you have seen the most recent Indiana Jones movie. Some of us were even discussing it not that long ago. Now throughout that movie, they sort of implied that perhaps Indy would hand over the the hero's mantle to the younger character introduced in the movie. Now to spoil the ending, but you've had like 15 years to see it, so uh, to spoil the ending, Indy's iconic hat gets blown off his head uh, as they're about to walk out of this church. And this younger hero picks it up. And at least I was cringing. As he starts to put this Indy's hat on his own head, only at the last moment for Indy to snatch it back, reclaiming that primary hero's mantle for himself, not letting it go to the one that would make a mess of it. God had handed the responsibility to rule creation over to Adam as his image bearer. Adam failed. Adam never properly wielded dominion or built the divine kingdom on earth. In Jesus Christ, God reclaimed the kingship role like Indy reclaims his fedora. The passing of the baton from Adam to Israel had never paid off. Israel's kings had, after all, been wildly unfaithful. But in Jesus Christ, the faithful Adam and the true Israel, God's kingdom finally is established as it should be. And so having been successful in that pattern where others failed, Jesus could announce the kingdom and announce it as a gospel kingdom. In Christ Jesus, God's kingdom has its establishment. And so we come to our second point. Expectations. Expectations. So, God's kingdom has a foundation in Jesus Christ. Getting us to the substance of of its nature, whether that's what you thought the ad on the label meant or not, getting us to the substance of its nature as a gospel kingdom. But what else does this narrative tell us about the nature of of this kingdom again? And we find that repeatedly, yet again, here, it defies expectations and the desires that people had in the first century concerning what God's kingdom would be like. Let's, let's think again about movies. right? One more time this morning. In every sci-fi movie you've ever seen, what happens when the alien spaceship shows up? Everyone 
right, looks at the sky, dumbfounded and quiet, or runs screaming. That's kind of the two options. You've not seen one where the onlookers casually ask, is that a spaceship? Now, the reason, though, is because the reality of it is obvious. There's no point in asking that question. It's very clear. Now, first century Israelites expected God's kingdom and its Messiah to arrive like an alien spaceship. There would be no question. Right? They expected it to be outward in glory and, a, and a impressive in its appearance. We know that Christ and His kingdom did not meet that expectation because of places like Acts 1.6 where even after Christ has risen, the disciples still ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still hadn't quite gotten it. They're still wondering the same thing that this gospel is teaching us. And His response to them there, likewise reinforces his kingdom's nature when he sends them to go preach the gospel, right, by the Spirit's power. In other words, they missed it still what the kingdom was supposed to be, even if they're about to get it, even if they were about to get it in Acts. And so, Jesus, well, he catches us off guard, doesn't he, in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Just simply by the action of announcing that God's kingdom has arrived in the preaching of the gospel. Because when when no one in the movies has to say, no one has to say that a spaceship has shown up, Jesus has to tell people that the kingdom of God has arrived. And the reason is because it did not come with the expected, anticipated, outward obviousness. Rather, it comes in a message that Christ is the one who fulfills Adam's task to keep the law and so imputes His righteousness to us by faith alone and thereby makes us citizens in that of God's kingdom reigning over us as our King. And as we pivot then into verses 16 to 20, we see how God's kingdom keeps defying expectations. Doesn't it? Kingdoms are supposed to originate in capital cities. Transform the culture, so we're told. And make shocking differences in the way that people do everything. And as Jesus begins announcing His kingdom, we find Him walking next to the sea, talking to fishermen. Far from having any obvious national or cosmic significance, well, we find again that the shock of God's gospel kingdom in in Christ starts with a, a conversation with some guys who are fishing. In nearly every respect, then, Christ's kingdom breaks expectations. And that brings us to our final point, expansion. If God's gospel kingdom in Christ doesn't grow by cultural clout, nor by strength of might, nor by obvious outward prestige... I imagine our question then is, well, how does it grow? And already in Mark's gospel, we see that it grows in the same way that it began. We know that it, it began with God, because Christ is God's Son. We know that it began with a message about repenting from sin and believing in the gospel. We know that it began by summoning specific people to come and follow Christ. Well, it expands in the same God-originating, Christ-focused, message-driven manner in which it began. 
Now, how do we see that here? Well, in verses 16 to 20, Jesus finds a number of his soon-to-be disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And he, and he called them into his service. Right? And I, I think, I'm convinced, that we should presume that this summons included the gospel pronouncement of the kingdom's arrival and the summons to faith. Right after all, in, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel and saying the message of the kingdom. Proclaiming and saying our ongoing activities, not simple past tense one-time actions. He kept doing the proclaiming and saying. And so undoubtedly Jesus led this encounter with the fishermen with the gospel message. They, then having trusted in Christ uh, as presented in the gospel, well, then Jesus summoned them to become fishers of men. Now, I... I think, if I, were, if I were a betting man, but I'm a Presbyterian, I'd be willing to bet, <laughs> that we often assume that the title, Fishers of Men, that we just think that that's simply Jesus' catchy and metaphorical way to connect with these soon-to-be disciples, as if he had used it to connect with their worldly vocation. I think that's... I think that's how that strikes us at first. Listen to Habakkuk 1, verses 14 and 15, as the prophet addressed the Lord. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. In Jeremiah 16, 15 and 16, God promised, For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. In other words, God is the ultimate fisher of men, promising to redeem his people as the one who catches men like fish. He fishes for his people to bring them back to their land. So Christ Jesus, God the Son, brings people to himself where his kingdom is concentrated. The place where we are to dwell is in Christ. And then, as in Jeremiah... Well, God the Son sends for fishers who will catch His people. And so Jesus Christ, the divine Messiah, acting in God's role to fulfill God's promises through Habakkuk and Jeremiah, calls His disciples into service to become fishers of men. And so, the kingdom remains divine in origin, as God, the true fisher of men, uses his, well, underfishers to catch his people into his kingdom. The kingdom remains Christ-focused in that we enter the kingdom only through Christ and the kingdom remains message-driven in that Christ and his underfishers catch people for the kingdom by announcing the gospel. What do we learn? What do we learn here? We learn to appreciate God's presence with his people in simple things. If you think you're too far removed from the world's happenings, well, know that that's the sort of place and with the sort of people that Christ's kingdom began. You're never too far away for Christ to know exactly who and where you are to reach you. God has been ostentatious in displaying his glory and all that he has created, right? And his abundance and beauty are clearly shown in the splendor of creation. But for redemption, interestingly, 
He hides the flood of his kingdom's glory in a Jewish carpenter who worked with fishermen. And so, we too learn how, we learn to value how God is at work as he gives us, well, ordinary vocations. And by that I don't mean just your paid employment. I mean all the things that God would have you do, whether you're paid for it or not. He gives us ordinary vocations where we can love our neighbor. He gives us families whereby we know his own love for us as his adopted children. And he gives us life and breath to show how he sustains us in all ways. Your vocation, whatever it is, and I mean that, whether it's in the home, whether it's at an office, whether it's something you do with your family, friends, and neighbors, your vocation is good even if you don't turn the world upside down through it. God's appointed it for you, for his good purposes. And we see him work in simple things. We also learn the value of the church. Because the kingdom still advances in the same way that it did in Jesus' day. The proclamation of the gospel by those whom Jesus summons into a specific calling of fishing for men. Through the gospel. He still concentrates his kingdom in the message about himself. Advancing his kingdom. That is the visible church as we saw our confession say. Through disciples opening the word. And so, while we learn to set aside the hopes we have for outward glory in this age for some sort of Christian society or any other artifice of this age, that is not the shape of God's kingdom today. The fullness of deity dwells bodily in the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn to find glory in a simple place, the church, and in simple things like word and sacrament. And treasuring not the comforts of our world and the upper hand in the cultures. No, rather, we learn to treasure our encounters with the Lord. The Lord Jesus in the announcement of his grace. God's Son has won our salvation by submitting to the law, which he had no obligation to obey until he became incarnate in our nature. And by dying on a cross to pour out his blood to purchase our lives. Jesus is, well, at the end of the day, the inverse of flashy food packaging with weird ingredients. He looks plain. And it's a simple message. But is the most satisfying in content. And he gives himself to us for our nourishment in his word and in this meal that we're about to partake. Let's pray. Father God, we are glad that in a disconnected world where people feel like they have to log into the internet, have social media to be connected, well, our God has come near to us. You do not remain aloof. You came to earth in the Lord Jesus. You give us yourself in the gospel. And you come to us week by week in Lord's Day worship. And you meet us here at this table to dine with us. Help us, Lord, to know all the more the privilege that it means to come here to eat with the God of the universe, to feed upon Christ, our King. We pray that we would be moved by the splendor, indeed, of this moment. We ask that as we come to this table that you would set apart this time, that you would make this meal effective for the ends that you've appointed it, that you would nourish us in growth, and in grace, 
that we might know you more fully, that we might have a clearer sense of who you are and what you have done for us in the Lord Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen.